Okay, here's our opportunity to focus entirely on the breath. You have no other duties right now, no other obligations. Just put the body in a posture where you don't have to worry about it. Sit up straight, focus, look straight ahead, close your eyes, hands in your lap, right hand on top of the left. And there you are, the breath. And look at this as an opportunity. You're not tying the breath down. You're not imprison excuse me, you're not tying the mind down to the breath. You're not imprisoning it. Think of this as an opportunity to explore. To see what is actually going on when the breath comes in, when the breath goes out. How does it affect the body? And the only way you'll notice that is if you experiment. John Lee says it's like getting some silver. You don't really understand silver, he says, until you melt it down. Try to make different things out of it. That's when you start to understand its properties. In other words, you, you fool around with it. You play with it. And in the course of playing with it, you learn a lot about cause and effect. And at the same time, you can keep yourself engrossed. I mean, this is what the mind likes to do. It likes to see relationships. It likes to figure things out. So give it something to figure out. What's the best way to breathe right now? Best being defined as what's most nourishing for the body. Feels most comfortable for the mind. Comfortable here can mean either relaxed or energized. What would you like right now from the breath? And see how you can focus on the breath, adjust the breath in a way that gets what you want out of it. Learn how to entertain yourself with the breath. And John Fung used to talk about this a lot. He said, learn how to play with the breath. Now, for him, playing didn't mean just playing around in a desultory way. For him, playing meant like playing the way a skilled athlete would play a game. You try to do it really well. Look at it as a challenge and interesting an entertaining challenge. So once an an Ajahn in the forest tradition who complained to Ajahn Lee, he heard that Ajahn Lee was focusing on the breath as his main topic for teaching meditation. And this particular Ajahn said, what is there in the breath? It's just in and out. How can you get any insight there? And Ajahn Lee said, if that's all you see, then that's all there is. Depends on what you see, what you look for. Your ability to pose questions. Years back, I was spending the night in a house out in the woods in northwest Washington. The people who owned the house weren't there. So we had the house pretty much to ourselves. And notice they didn't have a TV. What they did have, though, was there were lots of games, lots of brain teasers on the shelves in the living room, lots of books. In other words, without prepackaged entertainment, they'd learn how to entertain themselves. Thomas Mann, in his novel Joseph and His Brothers, which is his retelling of the Joseph story. When it gets to the point where Joseph is thrown into prison, has 
Joseph entertaining himself by interpreting his own dreams, interpreting the dreams of his fellow inmates. And after a while he gets good at it, starts interpreting the dreams of the warders, the wardens, on up to the chief warden in the prison. And he makes the comment that the sign of an intelligent person is the ability to keep yourself entertained, even in difficult circumstances. Of course, what happens in the novel, eventually the, you know, the pharaoh sends out words that he's got this dream that nobody can explain to his satisfaction. And the prison warden suggests that Joseph might be a good person to try because he's so good at interpreting dreams. So his, the game he was playing, the entertainment he had, actually proved to have some worth. Got him out of prison, eventually reunited him with his family. That's the ideal kind of entertainment, where you keep yourself entertained and you learn. Provide yourself with opportunities. Because after all, the breath energy is what keeps the body alive. It's what keeps mind and body together. And it stands to reason that if the breath feels good, it's going to be good for the body, good for the mind. And particularly if you learn how to understand the breath, it's not just air coming in and out of the lungs. It's the whole energy flow in the body. Some parts of it flow, some parts of it are still. And when you look at it in this way, you realize there's breath everywhere in the body, all the way out to the pores of the skin, in all the nerves, and all along the blood vessels. The movement of this energy is what lets you know that there's a body sitting here. It keeps the circulation going well. When the circulation is good, then it's less likely you're going to get diseases. It also makes the present moment a much more pleasant place to stay. Things feel wide open. The body as a whole is breathing in unison. It feels really good. This is how focusing on the breath can lead to a sense of fullness in body, a sense of pleasure, a sense of well-being and ease, all of which are factors of the path. Right concentration has among its factors the ease of concentration, the rapture that can arise from concentration, the ability to experience pleasure through the body. And you can induce it by getting more interested in what this potential is that you have here. This is one of the basic messages of the Buddhist teachings on karma, that the present moment is not totally fashioned by your past karma. You have choices you can make in the present that have an effect immediately. You don't have to wait to your next lifetime to see those results. The effects can come immediately, which means that each present moment has certain opportunities. Now there are some limitations based on past karma, past choices. But within those limitations, there's still space to choose what to focus on, to choose how you're going to understand it, what you're going to do with it. When I was up camping in Canada recently, there were days when there was, the rain just lasted day, all through the day, all through the night. You're stuck in your tent. And you could make yourself miserable if you wanted to. But you could also look at it as an opportunity. No responsibilities. All that time to be with a breath. In other words, no matter how bad the situation may be, as in Joseph's case, he was in prison. But you've always got your breath. 
and there's always something to learn. You look at a John Lee's Dharma talks, and he talks about the breath energy in the body in lots of different ways. That method two that he's in keeping the breath in mind. He developed that when he was stuck up in the in the forest in northern Thailand. He'd walked in three days. He was going to spend the rains retreat at this very remote area with just a hill tribes village nearby. And a few days after he got there, he had a heart attack. No doctor, no medicine. He had to put himself back together again. And he did it by working with the breath energy and the lessons he learned during that rains retreat, putting himself back together so that he was able to walk out at the end of the rains, three days walking through the jungle. That was the basis for Method 2. And in the years after that, he read in his Dharma talks, he had other ways of working with the breath energy that are not described in Method 2. Some of them are in the book Inner Strength, some of them are a skill of release, food for thought. Basically it came from seeing what the body needed and what way of conceiving of the breath, what play, way of adjusting the breath energy helped for that particular imbalance in the body, that particular problem in the body. He was always willing to learn, always willing to experiment. So that's the attitude we should have as meditators. There's a lot to learn here in the present moment. There are lots of opportunities. If you look for them, they're there. And this way the, the hour of meditation becomes not an exercise in just tying yourself down, but of opening yourself up, learning about cause and effect in the mind. Because it's, it's not just idle entertainment, say sending the breath down to the legs, down to the arms. If you learn about cause and effect, you're headed in the right direction, because that's what the Buddha's teachings are all about, is understanding cause and effect, how the mind creates the conditions for suffering and how it can create the conditions that lead to the end of suffering. After all, the Buddha, when he boiled down the big message of his awakening, it was an understanding of cause and effect. Some causes give their effects over time, some of them give their effects immediately. And if you learn how to understand the connections between cause and effect in the mind, you can direct them in the direction you want them to go. Total end of suffering. And working with the breath is a good place to start. So each time you sit down to meditate, look at it as an opportunity. You can give your total attention to the breath, total attention to the way the mind relates to the breath, and then you can play. And through playing around like this, you learn important lessons. So it's not just idle play. It's an exercise in developing intelligence. particularly the intelligence that can see what's the connection between your intentions and the pleasure and pain that you experience. It's all playing out right here. It's simply a matter of learning how to experiment to see what is connected to what. And which choices you make are skillful, which ones are not. And how to motivate yourself to work on being as skillful as possible. It's work, but it's entertaining work, because there are lots of surprises.
if you rule out the element of surprise, you rule out any possibility of progress on the path. So think of meditation as the opportunity to surprise yourself and see what happens. <laughs>